Hello, I'm Liam Halligan, a former academic and now a journalist. These days I've also got the rather harder task of being a parent. Since having kids, my economist's mind has been ticking over. Just how do they decide how much money is spent in the classroom and on which pupils? How should schools spend their money to stop standards slipping? How should they balance their books? And are government claims of record high spending, reality, or just spin? Yes, resources do matter, um, but probably only to a limited extent, and certainly to a lesser extent than other factors that determine children's educational attainment. You go to some schools and they say, wow, we've got more money we've ever had before, it's fantastic, the teachers are, you know, you go to others and you'll get moans that they haven't got the money to do this or to do that. Are the best resourced schools the best schools? Are, are the best schools always well resourced? The answer is no. As well as the economists and politicians, we'll also be talking to the experts on the ground, people like you who work in schools. We've had the fire officers report. The one major area of expenditure is going to be mm. placing a fire door into the swimming pool. And we know that's going to come in at £10,000. And we'll be slicing up the national education cake and serving up the crumbs left for the classroom. Spend it wisely. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, your school may have one of these, a money tree to provide an endless supply of cash for everything that you and your pupils need. But if you haven't got a money tree in your grounds, I'm afraid you're going to have to rely on the generosity of the government. The government, of course, doesn't have a money tree either, but it's got the next best thing, taxes. Education, like all the other public services, has to vie for its share from the national coffers. Barry Shearman, as chairman of the Education Select Committee, has the job of scrutinising what's spent on schools. Does the Education Secretary knock on the Chancellor's door and say, I need so many billion quid? How does it work? Well, I think uh, he or she actually um, crawls there on, on their knees and then knocks, <laughs> to be truthful, because, you know, the Treasury is enormously powerful and, of course, what they say goes and their remit is to keep a very close eye on spending in every department. So, the Department for Education gets its money from the Treasury, but how does that cash make its way to the classroom? To find out, I'm off to Birmingham, the UK's second city and the country's biggest local authority. And in particular, I've come here to College High School in the Erdington district of the city. Now, there's a good reason I've come to this school, but more of that later, because right now, I've got some baking to do. <laughs> Welcome to the Chancellor's Budget Kitchen. But we're not here to cook the books. We're here to bake a cake. An education budget cake. How much do you think we spend on education in England every single year? Probably hundreds or thousands. Hundreds or thousands in the whole of England? About three million. About three million. Billions, probably. Billions? Billions. How many billions? About 50. So just how much money does go into the education mix? Well, for England, in 2006-07, the answer... Oh, £72 billion. Pounds. How does that compare with other public services? Well, the defence budget annually is... Oh, £29 billion. Then you've got transport at £21 billion. And housing and the environment at £19 billion. But all these departments are absolutely dwarfed by the enormous health budget which comes in at... £96 billion. Pounds. Just give us a little inside line on the real politique of how the money's carved up. Well, you have to go back a place. Politicians listen to what the voter and the electorate are saying. At the moment, education is still up there, but lobbying to keep it up. If you're a teacher or a professional, it's a key role. Uh, and then... Politicians, the Secretary of State walks through into the Treasury, walks into number 10, and he can then say, look, this is what the people want, that's why I want it. It's as crude as that? Yes, it is as crude as that. Well, here is our education budget cake. It's been baked by Tim Evers here and the children at College High. It represents the £72 billion, which is the education budget in England. We're going to slice it up and see where the money goes. 
Now, the first slice that Tim's going to cut for us is a relatively small slice. That's worth £350 million, which is the budget for activities for all functions. That's administration for civil servants in Whitehall and elsewhere. Now, slice number two, Tim, that's for Sure Start. That's worth £1.3 billion, and that's for parents and their children providing support for them in disadvantaged areas. And then the next slice up, slightly bigger, £1.4 billion, that's to provide support for children and families in programmes such as Every Child Matters. A £7.8 billion serving, that's around a tenth of the whole budget, that goes to higher education. We're now getting to really big slices of money. £8.4 billion, that goes towards the pensions every year of everyone involved in education. The next big chunky item on the menu, the school's capital budget for repairing and rebuilding new schools, classrooms and offices. That's worth £9 billion. And then, the hefty budget for further education and lifelong learning. That's another £9.1 billion. Which leaves us, in the end, out of £72 billion, with £34 billion for schools themselves in England, most of which is passed on to local authorities. No one can dispute that the Labour government has put taxpayers' money where Tony Blair's mouth was on education, education, education. The budget for education in England increased by nearly 50% between 2000 and 2005. Over the same period, average funding per pupil has grown from £3,800 to £4,800 if you put capital expenditure and private finance initiatives into the mix, and the Chancellor certainly does, the figure per pupil is £5,500 for 2006 still a long way short of £8,000, the average amount spent on each pupil in the independent sector. At University College London, I found a former academic colleague of mine who's one of the top education economists in the country, if not the world. Professor Steve Machin, as the director of the Centre for the Economics of Education, is regularly sought after by ministers and officials. Is there a good economic reason why we should spend more on education? Well, education has clearly been, been, over time, has been progressively becoming more important for economic outcomes for people as adults. We know there's an increased return to education, uh, an increased return in terms of labour market outcomes. People, people these days who have better educational qualifications receive higher wages, um, which implies higher productivity levels. So for, if, if, if we think that improving the skills base of the economy through improved education through schools um, can work, then yes, there are good economic arguments for spending more money. Let's have a look at that £34 billion. That's the slice of public money that goes on all state schools in 2006-07. Now, the first big slice we've got is £1.83 billion. That goes to sixth forms and is distributed by the Learning and Skills Council. The next big slice, that's for investment in school buildings, including the Building Schools for the Future programme, that's 3.9 billion. There's 1.7 billion set aside for modernising the teaching profession, 80 million to improve school meals, and then 79 million for what the budget calls miscellaneous. But out of what's left, there's one other quite big slice to come off, and that's 707 million for the new Schools Academy programme. Which leaves us finally, Tim, with 26.5 billion, which goes to all other schools. That's money distributed through local authorities. Although local authorities continue to give out the money to schools, they can no longer dictate how it's spent. We clearly have a move to devolve autonomy down to school level, and many of the recent, um, recent government initiatives have, have been targeted in that kind of direction. Um, so there's some interesting, again from an economist's perspective, there's some interesting questions about whether there's potentially different divergence of interests between, between different parties involved here. And of course, if there is divergence of interests, then that can cause inefficiencies um, in, in, in the system. Um, so I, so I, I, but what, what do you mean by that, divergence of interests? The increased autonomy going down to a more devolved level at school level actually takes away some of the autonomy from the local education authority. So they're bypassed. And so that's one way of thinking about it. Um, I mean, again, it's too early days to really appraise that um, in, 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 terms of, in terms of what's been going on. But it is definitely true that many more schools have autonomy now over hiring teachers, which used to be the domain of the local education authority. 
um, of allocating money um, to particular um, particular parts of a budget within their schools, whether they allocate more money to teacher salaries or to ICT or to infrastructure investments and so on. So what share of this £26.5 billion does this area get? Birmingham? Well, it gets £718 million. That's its dedicated schools grant. In other words, this local authority has to spend that money on schools. It can't spend it on anything else like road sweeping, social services, civic receptions or whatever. This money has to go on schools. Most of the dedicated school grant is passed on directly to schools. £664 million in total, which is called the Delegated Schools Grant. This is how it's shared out between schools in Birmingham. Well, the first big chunk, 52 million, that's for special schools. This is for nursery and primary schools, 328 million in Birmingham. And this is for secondary schools in Birmingham, that's 283 million pounds. Just like all other local authorities, yeah. Birmingham has a funding formula to work out how much should be given to each school. To help understand how the funding works, I talked to Lindsay Warmby, a former head teacher who now advises schools on finance. Well, the local authority gets the dedicated schools grant, and that's its schools budget. The bulk of it, the vast majority of it, is then uh, distributed to the schools using uh, the local authorities' for a fair funding formula. So there's usually an amount per pupil. Um, there will be additional money for youngsters who have need additional help. Um, of course, there's in there the money for youngsters who've got special educational needs. Um, so there are all of those things uh, in the formula. Every authority formula follows similar lines. Most of the money's allocated to primary and secondary schools using what's called the age-weighted pupil unit. In Birmingham, the pupil unit currently stands at £2,036.57, and pence, which is the amount primary schools get for each and every key stage two pupil. But remember, I said it was age weighted, and when a pupil moves up to key stage three, it goes up to £2,628.20. Year 10 pupils are worth £3,079.90, and year 11 pupils, well, they attract £3,239.78. There's also a little more for key stage one pupils and nursery children because they need higher staffing levels. The age-weighted pupil unit accounts for around 65% of the money given to schools. There are also a whole range of funds to cover buildings and maintenance costs. And then there's extra money for schools in economically deprived areas worked out mainly on the basis of how many pupils receive free school meals. So how much of Birmingham's delegated schools grant for secondary schools, that 283 million, goes to College High, where we are now? Well, it's 4.4 million pounds. With 1,050 pupils, that means College High gets around 4,200 pounds per pupil. And here's head teacher Kim Pratnak. She's not looking too happy. That's your bit, 4.4 million pounds. What do you think? Not a lot, really. I think I'd sooner have that piece there. <laughs> and in relation to my, my, my school, this doesn't look a, an awful lot, but I'm sure we'll have to cut our cloth accordingly. So when College High comes to share out its rather meagre slice of the national education cake, the amounts left for individual departments aren't that large. OK, so we're looking at VCOP. We can think about using... Come in. Hi, you're Sharon Green, Head of English. I've got your piece of our education budget cake. Here's your £6,215 to run your department for a year. Spend it wisely. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> what would you do if you did have a bit more cash to, to spend on the class? We spend it on more innovations, I think, and doing things outside of the uh, essential requirements. So plays... Theatre trips. <laughs> New, uh, new teaching resources to kind of broaden the breadth and scope of our teaching as well. Hello there. Hello, you Mr Khan? I am. I'm Liam. This is nice uh, the crumbs. £6,700 from our education cake is the math department share. It literally is crumbs. Do you find you've got a shortage of money or do you think that there's enough money going around? There certainly isn't enough money now. We, uh, we need a lot more resources and we need, to, we need to give these kids what they deserve. Do you think enough money is being spent in this school? Do you see it spending more like things to go outdoor, more trips to Shakespeare, etc. Science, you could have more better departments, like more practicals. 
more like equipment spent on better laboratories, etc. What does it mean to you when your school can do those extra things like practicals, like trips? Does it make school more interesting? Do you learn more, do you it, think? It makes it more exciting and wanting to learn more about the topic that you're doing and stuff like that. Do you think there's areas in education that should be prioritised more, Otis? Yeah, most likely the three main subjects of math, science and English. Of course, us grown-ups know that public service spending is a black hole that could suck in any amount of resources. Knowing where to make the priorities is a little trickier. But College High does, like other schools, benefit from another important source of money. You'll remember Birmingham received £718 million in the dedicated school grant, and we've distributed that via the delegated budget here. But there's another important source this slice of cake, you may remember, that represents £54 million in devolved grants. Dedicated, delegated, devolved. I need a detox. Is this complexity damaging? Do you think it's a waste of money, a waste yes, of... Yes, it has been. I mean, certainly in the past, when schools were doing a lot of bidding for small amounts and not getting them or having to, to jump through lots of hoops or account to the last penny or make sure they'd spent all the money by March the 31st when you, actually your school year goes on till the end of August, all of that was very, very complex and unnecessarily wasteful. At the moment, probably the most complex area of funding is in funding extended schools activities, which is a bit of a minefield at the moment but the rest of the system has simplified. If it's got simpler, I'm glad I wasn't making this programme when it was complicated. Now that devolved money, that extra bit of cake, is mostly what's referred to as standard funds and includes money targeted at particular problems, like helping inner city areas through the Excellence in Cities programme. But the standard funds are being brought together under a new heading, the Development Grant, one lump sum which schools can spend as they see fit. But then there are also standard grants. So that makes it simple, doesn't it? These standard grants are in effect one-off gifts from the Chancellor. You've probably seen him on Budget Day, saying he's found a few billion quid down the back of the nation's sofa, so he's going to give it directly to schools. Now these extra funds add up to about £1.2 million for College High which boosts the school's budget to around 5.7 million. That means the school now has around £5,400 per pupil for the financial year 2006-07. How important is this extra money? This is extremely important because this is the money that enables us to buy additional furniture. This enables us to buy the heating that actually warms the examination hall for my pupils. It enables us to actually uh, by the fencing that makes my school secure. So this, the devolved capital, is really, really important for us as a school. So let's look in a little more detail at where the money goes at College High by moving from cake to liquid refreshment. In total, from all the funds we've discussed, College High has just under £5.7 million to spend in 2006-07. With the help of some magic from Head of Science, Connery Wiltshire, we've divided the budgets into five areas, each represented by a different liquid. By far the smallest share goes into departmental budgets, around £140,000. Over £405,000 spent on maintenance, cleaning and power. Nearly £425,000 devoted to raising standards through targeted support for pupils and professional development for staff. £550,000 goes on different supplies and necessities ranging from postage and copying to insurance and first aid. And just over £4 million pays for school staff, including agency cover, clerical help and other support. So, Connery, are, are you surprised at these proportions? Look at the size of the teachers' wages compared to the departmental budget. That's a bit of a farce, really. Um, that's expected. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised to some extent, but uh, yes, I'm also surprised about the extent of uh, money that's spent in departments, which is where the teaching goes on, isn't it? There is one answer. Yeah. We could pour some of this wage money into that one, what do you think? I don't think that's a great idea, actually. Because <laughs> uh, then I would actually not make very, you know, many friends saying that sort of thing, because <laughs> that's needed. But is it all about money? The reason why we chose College High out of all the secondary schools in Birmingham is because just two years ago, it was the lowest achieving school in the city, with a GCSE A to C pass rate of just 11%. 
in one year, the pass rate jumped to 34%. The school didn't get any extra money or favours, so what made the difference? Could it be because the school's new head allocated the cash differently, concentrating on improving the image of the school? Our whole emphasis as a school this year will be and has been on teaching and learning, which we haven't been able to do for two years because of the way that the school has moved forward and what we've had to do and things that we've had to put in place. And some of those have been cosmetic. Kim channeled resources into renovating the front of the school and improving the appearance of the corridors and classrooms. Staff and pupils were given a decent environment where they could work. Money was spent on producing this glossy prospectus to help promote the place, but also to make everyone feel good about their school. But Kim decided against painting the back of the building and diverted the money instead to new technology. And now College High School has new priorities, competing for a share of the pot that's not large enough to meet all of them. In terms of ICT, to do everything else you want to do this year, we need probably an additional 40,000. The ICT development, I think, is crucial. Mm -hmm. Follow on from last year's upgrade of a CCTV yeah. system will take uh, 12 ,000 or 13,000. The office alterations, which are fairly essential because of the lack of space, are 5,000. And then we need to uh, replace the heating in F22, which is going to cost a further five. But I'm also concerned about the heating in the main hall, because although that sounds cosmetic, in fact, it's very, very much a curriculum mm. issue. It is. That is a huge space that we cannot use. So it would clearly be, for me, the closed-circuit television, because I think that improves the safety around the site. It also improves student behaviour. Could I just sit in, folks? Yeah. Just listening to... The discussion here, you're tr clearly trying to make absolutely the best use of the resources you've got. To be fair to the government, what has helped us is in terms of um, they've given us a clear indication of what our budgets will be, not only this year, next year, the year after. So in terms of one of the things I'm involved in and, and very keen and I'm working with the last couple of years is the long-term strategic... That helps you plan. Financial planning, yeah. so what we're trying to Like do any is, business. Absolutely. Yeah. Now it, our concentration must be on improvement of results and actually giving the best facilities for the students that we have. So ICT development, the, I, the cameras that, that Paul has spoken about, really are a priority for us as a school. Come and buy some cakes. But what do you do when your budget won't pay for everything you want for your pupils? Of course, you can write very nice letters to parents and appeal to the generosity and the appetites of the pupils themselves. No one knows exactly how much is raised across the country by way of voluntary contributions to supplement school budgets, but it can make all the difference. 30p for a cake, three for a pound or 30p. This is Head of Geography, Laura Chin. She wants to take a group of pupils on a field trip they'll never forget. Actually, they're not bad. 30 pence each or three for a pound. <laughs> you should be in marketing. <laughs> We're raising money for a geography trip to Iceland with um, 17 GCSE geography students. And we've got to raise £4,000 to get them to go. You know, just because you're born on this side of the, of the Chester Road or this side of Birmingham, it doesn't mean you're not entitled to the same educational opportunities as other pupils are. A lot of our pupils... From leafier, more yeah, prosperous areas. Exactly. They will... Our pupils, they will go on to achieve 10 A-star to C grades. So just because they go to this school or just because they're from this area, they, they deserve the same opportunities. I'm not saying that... You know, there are vast pots of money for the leafier suburbs. I'm sure that's not the case. But our schools, our school is disadvantaged. If you're going to go, then I don't mind putting some contribution towards it, but it is quite a large amount to do by yourself. So it would be helpful if somebody else gave some money as well. How's your fundraising going? Um, my mum and dad are paying for mine. But um, my mum said I've got to get some of it myself, but I think she'll pay for it. According to The Economists, it's support from mum and dad and family background that are still the most crucial factors in influencing a child's educational achievements. It certainly isn't all about money, in the sense that the most important determinant of children's educational attainment is actually not the school. It's actually the home and family background that they, tend, that they experience themselves. Now, within the school context, sure, there is evidence that increased resources can improve educational attainment. But it's very clear that if you spend more money on something, it has to be cost effective. So what's the experts' advice on making those cost effective decisions and raising standards? You'd have to start from where the school is and look at what they're spending their money on now. I mean, there's very good benchmark data available. They can see whether they're spending their money 
you know, in, a, in the same way as similar schools. And you might say, well, OK, but now we've got to think about hard about uh, your use of resources. You know, what is it that's holding this school back? Is it that the staff are working in cold, unfriendly, you know, damp classrooms, in which case you've got to do something about your um, maintenance? Or is it that they simply don't have the resources they need to develop the curriculum in the way they want to, in which case you've got to think about resources, but you can't, there isn't a simple answer. All research shows it's the leadership in the school, the commitment of the teachers, and if the teachers see that these children they've got are an amazing potential that can, can do wonderful things with their lives, then you've got a good school. If you've got a group of people saying, what do you expect us to do with these kids? They come from poor, socially deprived backgrounds, what do you expect us to do? Then you know that school's lost its way. It's undeniable, I think, that teacher quality matters. And so clearly one thing that needs to be done is to make the teaching profession more attractive to, high, to recent graduates who are, who are coming through. Now I think in the, recent, in, the, in the recent past that actually has happened and I think more people have been attracted into the teaching profession. However, don't expect any extra help from the government to pay for more and better staff. Growth in the education budget, which has been between 7 and 8% a year, is due to slow down to between 2 and 3%. The current government, like those before it and no doubt those to follow, is naturally confident that standards in our schools will continue to rise, despite the spending slowdown. The Department for Education believes that the huge expansion in budget since 1999 has given schools the money and momentum to ensure future success. For the sake of my kids, I hope they're right.